So we're about to complicate the picture a little bit more because this time around we're going to talk about ionic compounds where we do have a cation and an anion present, right? And the cation has a positive charge. It appears first on the structure. The anion has a negative charge and appears last on the structure. Um, and what's going to happen is that either the cation or the anion could be a um, transition metal complex. And so we're going to have to name um, the entire ionic complex. The typical way you would name an ionic substance like sodium chloride, for instance, but this time the cation and anion or both could be transition metal complexes. All right, so we're going to look at all those, all those possibilities. Uh, the cation could be regular, like sodium, potassium, and the coordination complex could be the anion. Or the cation could be the coordination complex, and the anion could be something regular, like bromide, chloride, completely outside of the complex. Or both of them could be coordinative complexes. So we're going to look at each one of those um, situations. Now, in the case where you have a regular uh, coordination complex, um, yes, uh, the idea is that the metal, you know, even for a regular ionic substance, binary, um, you might need to spell out the oxidation state of the metal. Uh, if you have a regular anion, they usually will end up with IDE, IT, or eight. These are anions that are not part of the complex, but are there to balance the charge of the entire thing. But if you do have a coordination complex, you will have to name all of the ligands and with the metal along with the charge of the metal. And if the coordination complex is part of the anion, then you will have to name the complex, you know, alphabetically with the ligands followed by the name of the metal. But you actually have to change the name of the metal somewhat. Uh, in particular, you're going to introduce the suffix eight to the metal to emphasize the idea that that metal complex is part of an anionic complex. All right, so usually the way this goes is that for the most part, you're going to drop a few letters at the end of the metal and you're going to add the suffix eight. So when you look at the vast majority of the transition metals, for all of the ones that I'm highlighting here in yellow, you literally drop the IUM uh, ending of the metal, right? So the scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, rhodium, palladium, cadmium, iridium, that IUM gets dropped and you add the eight. So instead of calling it chromium, you call it chromate. Instead of calling it vanadium, you call it vanadate. Instead of calling it titanium, now it's titanate, renate, osmate, iridate, rhodate, palladate, cadmate. All right? Those are the simple ones. Then you have a few others that end in interesting names like UM, EN, ESE, or Y. So manganese, molybdenum, tungsten, and mercury. What you're going to do is you're going to drop those particular final letters and you're going to replace them with eight. So manganese becomes manganate. Molybdenum becomes molybdate. Mercury becomes mercurate, uh, tungsten becomes tungstate, tan tantalum becomes tantalate, etc., etc. And then you have a few more that have an uh, interesting name. Oh, by the way, before we get into the interesting ones, uh, cobalt, nickel, and zinc. These ones are actually probably the easiest ones because all you're going to do is add the ending ATE to each one of these metals. And that's basically all you do. So cobalt becomes cobaltate, nickel becomes nickelate, and zinc becomes zincate. But then you have a few extra elements like iron, copper, silver, and gold, which you have to do something else in addition to adding the ATE ending. You have to use the Latin names just because it wasn't hard enough. <laughs> so for iron, you're going to use the word ferrous or you know, that comes from the Latin name, but you're going to end it with eight, so it'll be ferrate. For copper, you want to name it cuprate. For silver, this is argentate, and gold is orate. So this is the way you're going to name the transition metals if they happen to be part of an anionic complex.
uh, we're also going to include tin and lead for these purposes. So we'll even include those guys, even though they're not transition metals, in which case you have stannate for tin and you have plumbate for lead. If we make transition, excuse me, co coordinated covalent complexes with them, which happen to be anionic. All right, so let's do a few examples to see how this goes. Notice here that in this particular structure, I'm using the brackets to enclose the transition metal CO and the ligand EN. And what that means is that what's in brackets and is appearing first is a transition metal complex. Anything outside of the brackets is considered to be uh, unbound. It's considered to be outside of the metal sphere. It's going to be there to balance the charge, but it's not bound to the metal. Uh, and so the only coordination complex is the first one. And since we are starting with the transition metal complex, that means that this is the cationic portion of the ionic uh, salt. And the nitrate, of course, is going to be the anionic portion of the salt. So we start by naming the cation. Okay, and we have ethylene diamine as a ligand. We have three of them since ethylene diamine has the word di within it. We use the prefix tris to emphasize the amount. So we have tris ethylene diamine. And CO stands for cobalt, so we input cobalt in there. Now, this is the cation portion of the salt. So here you don't have to add the ATE ending. If you call this cobaltate, you're automatically wrong. You're automatically marked down for that. Uh, this is just regular cobalt. The charge, we're going to figure out in a second. But the ligand that comes after it is regular nitrate, not nitrato, because this is not actually inside the brackets. It's outside. So this is a regular anion, and this is known as nitrate. So you basically name it like you would typically name calcium nitrate, right? You don't say calcium dinitrate, you say calcium nitrate. And by the same token, you would call this trisethylene diamine cobalt nitrate. Okay, now we need to figure out the charge. And ethylene diamine has no charge, that's a neutral ligand. But nitrate has a charge, a charge of minus one. Since we have two of them, that's gonna yield an overall two minus charge, right? And since ethylene diamine is neutral, it contributes no charge. So overall, we have X minus two equaling zero, which is the overall neutral charge of the entire ionic salt. And what this tells us is that the charge of cobalt is two. So what we wanna do is introduce the two as Roman numerals right after the cobalt. And so together, this compound will be known as trisethylene diamine cobalt 2 nitrate. And because you have three ethylene diamines, each, one's, each one of them being bidentate, you actually occupy six sides, meaning that this is an octahedral molecule. And so you could draw that cationic complex with a two plus charge uh, by integrating the ligands in this fashion, or you could actually change the order. And I know that this looks very similar, but what I want you to notice is that the nitrogen here on top is going counterclockwise towards its other nitrogen, which forms part of that ethylene diamine. Over here, starting from the top, we're moving clockwise. And that means that we're actually dealing with two different isomers present in here. Um, the one, where you go counterclockwise is known as the lambda isomer, lambda for left, and the other one is known as the delta isomer, delta for right. And this will be the quote unquote prefix symbols that you will use for the name of the molecule if you actually knew which one you were dealing with. All right, now let's do another example. Now notice here that we have sodium starting out and that's outside of the brackets. That means that sodium and sodium alone is the cation of this entire complex. And what that also tells us is that the brackets that come thereafter have to be the anionic portion of this salt. So we start by naming the cation, and the cation is named sodium. So that's the name of the cation. After that, we have to name the anion. And for that, since we're dealing with a coordination covalent complex, we need to start with the ligands. OH is hydroxyl. We have three of them, so we use the prefix tri. PI, excuse me, PY stands for pyridine. 
and H2O stands for aqua. And since there's two waters in there, we're going to use the prefix di. Now, alphabetically, aqua comes first, hydroxyl follows, and pyridine comes last. So, this will be known as sodium, diaqua, trihydroxyl, pyridine. And you, you end the name of the anion by naming the metal. But this is an anionic segment, right? So this cannot be named iron. It actually has to be known as ferrate. All right, so we name it ferrate instead of iron because this is the anionic portion of the salt. And now we figure out the charge. Sodium has a plus one charge. Iron, we're about to find out. Hydroxyl has a one minus charge. Pyridine and water are both neutral. So overall, we have one sodium. We have three hydroxyls with a three minus charge. So we have plus one minus three plus X equaling zero. And that means that X minus two equals zero or that iron itself has a charge of plus two. So we end the name by calling this ferrate two. So altogether, the name of the structure is sodium diaqua trihydroxyl pyridine ferrate two. All right, and as far as occupancy, each of the hydroxyl ligands, the pyridine and the waters occupy only one site each. We have three hydroxides, so that's three sites. We have one pyridine, that's a fourth site being occupied. And we have two waters, so that's a total of six sites occupied. So this is octahedral in shape. And you could actually have a number of different isomers drawn for this structure. You could have the three hydroxides in one plane uh, or a different plane. Right, in one instance, you have uh, the pyridine ligand uh, trans to one of the hydroxyls, and the other one, the hydroxyls are all cis to the pyridine. And then you could also have the uh, FAC isomer where the hydroxides occupy one phase. All right, so, um, oh yes, and one more thing. There is the possibility for stereoisomers, those where you draw mirror images of these molecules. And uh, these molecules, you could actually draw mirror images, and so they will have an antimers on top of the ones that I've drawn here. But this one doesn't actually have mirror images that are not super impossible. So this one only contains one stereoisomer. All right, now, altogether, the big picture here is the naming of the molecules. I will ask you probably to correlate the specific you could call it molecular formula, if you will, of the transition metal complex, and then ask you to draw the complex. So you have to pay attention to the uh, type of ligand that it is. Is it monodentate, bidentate? What is it? You know, how many sites are going to be occupied? But also keep track of that charge, the charge of the ligand, so that you can figure out the charge of the metal. All right, so we're going to stop right here, and we're going to continue the lecture uh, of transition metals in the next set of videos. So. I'll see you in lecture two.